this week on the Back Table Podcast. I think it is powerful when other medical organizations make statements. I mean, OBGYNs are involved in advocacy until we're blue in the face. And, you know, it does help to have other medical professionals who understand the medical system, understand what is evidence-based medicine, who can stand up and say, hey, this is important. This impacts people in other ways. We've had folks with the Cancer Center that have worked with us on op-eds. We've had folks from the law school, folks from across the medical center that have been involved in talking about these issues. And it's very powerful when medicine can be a united force to say, you know what, maybe we need to stand up for this. Maybe we need to speak out in a more vocal way. And also our OBGYN colleagues, we're getting tired. <laughs> we need some help. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Back Table OBGYN podcast, your source for all things obstetrics and gynecology. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and on backtable.com. This is Aditya Bagrodia as your host this week, and I'm very excited to introduce our guest today, Chloe Peters from the University of Washington and Bev Gray from Duke University. How are you all doing this morning? Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having us. So typically I'll do a little brief introduction of the guests, but I actually thought it might be nice to hear a little bit from your all's perspectives, a tidbit about yourself, how you became interested in women's health and women's advocacy issues. Chloe, would you like to start? Sure. I am currently a fourth year resident at University of Washington. I'm on my research here right now, and it's great to get reconnected with you. I, I first met Aditya on my sub at UT Southwestern a long time ago and was initially planning on doing some research in palliative care for my research year. And that was supposed to start July 1st. And on June 24th, the Dobbs decision happened. And it just felt like a really seismic moment that I wanted to look more into. And I've always been really passionate about women's health. And it felt like there were conversations that needed to be had, especially in the area of urology, around how this was going to impact our field, people in it, our patients, the workforce. And so I decided to change my research year topic. And I, I've spent the last year doing some work looking at how this ruling and abortion bans across the country might impact the urology workforce. Great. Thanks for that, Chloe. Bev, would you mind introducing yourself to the listenership? Yeah, so I'm Bev Gray. I'm an OBGYN at Duke University, and I have been working in OB for over a decade. And I was initially drawn to the field. I love surgery. I love the continuity of care of patients. And obstetrics is an exciting place to be. People probably have either some fond or terrifying memories of their OB rotation. But for me, it's one of my favorite places. And I was initially when I started residency, I wasn't, I didn't have a path towards family planning, but eventually I came to that work, partly because of an awesome mentor who really inspired me to do the work, and also just because of the gratitude that we felt from patients and how in a very short period of time you could care for someone and change the trajectory of their lives. And so that, for me, kind of kept me in the field and you know, when I was looking at residency programs, I, you know, wanted to train at a place that offered abortion care as part of the training, but it was sort of a given, you know, we were living in a time under row where people had access to care. And I was more concerned about geography, like being near my family, being in a place where my partner could have a successful job and career. And so those were the the main things on my mind when I was picking a residency. But I feel like, so I'm the residency director as well. And I feel this last year in recruiting, there was definitely a shift in questions people were asking, where people were applying. And so there's so many ramifications from the Dobbs decision. It's where to, where to begin. Yeah, I'm sure kind of navigating these these new issues as a trainee and as a trainer are um, getting increasingly complex. And as I was kind of thinking about structuring this, I thought it might be nice just to run through some like basic facts. So from your perspective, you know, I've, I've kind of read some statistics out there about what proportion of women, families, couples actually seek abortion care services over the course of their life. 
So it's incredibly common. And a lot of folks in this work will say, you probably know and love someone in your life who's had an abortion. So one in four women, by the time they reach menopause, will have needed abortion care. And so it's it's incredibly common. It cuts across socioeconomic status, race, religious affiliation. You know, we're coming up on Mother's Day and about 60% of patients seeking care are already mothers. And so people are making thoughtful decisions about their families, their futures, the families that they're caring for. And for me, in my life, my grandmother had an abortion when she was diagnosed with cervical cancer, and her abortion care saved her life. And this last two weeks in North Carolina has been very devastating because there's a new ban that's been passed in the House and Senate that will be vetoed by the governor. And there's a chance that there are votes to override this veto, which means that after July 1, it may be harder to care for people like my grandmother. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing that personal story. That's never easy. So maybe let's rewind to pre-June 24th of last year, if we could kind of get a landscape of what the U.S. was like in a pre-Dobbs era under Roe, as you'd mentioned, and then how things have shifted both once the Dobbs ruling came out and subsequently? So even before Dobbs, access to care was variable and there were disparities in access to care. So for a state like North Carolina, if you have Medicaid for insurance, which 50% of people do during pregnancy, it does not allow coverage for abortion care, unlike some other states like California, New York, Massachusetts. And, And that's because of the Hyde Amendment and being unable to use federal funds for abortion care. So states had to kind of pick up some of that cost, and and some states chose to do that, many have not. So already, you have many patients who were unable to access care previously um, because of cost. In the South, there were already inadequate numbers of providers in clinics providing care. So there's health care access, there's insurance coverage. For patients living in rural areas, they have to travel long distances to a clinic. And so this has just accelerated all of those difficulties and made the made the hurdles, made the hoops even higher to jump through. So, you know, people were cut off from care before, but it's it's going to get worse. Absolutely. The kind of practical components of obtaining an abortion, you know, access to providers, the cost of it, the proximity to providers. But under Roe, maybe just to kind of make sure everybody's on the same wavelength here, you were allowed to and given the right to receive an abortion legally through federal protection. Right. Through viability, essentially. So that's what Roe offered protection for. So now all of the the bans that are coming out pre-viability, in the past, you had protection from from this precedent from Roe. and, And that sort of the rug was pulled out from underneath people. And so we no longer had that protection. So in North Carolina, we for many years had a 20-week ban on the books. And for a couple of years, that ban was enjoined. So I was part of a lawsuit that sued the state of North Carolina about the 20-week ban, and it was unconstitutional because of the protections from Roe. But as soon as the Dobbs decision came out, two months later, the 20-week ban went back into effect in North Carolina. Viability is usually around 24 weeks. Okay, yeah, I was just going to ask for just a couple of terminology. So viability, 24 weeks, enjoined, that's a foreign term to me. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, if you're in this field, you have to have like a mini law degree to be able to do your work on a day-to-day basis. So spend a lot of time with lawyers, a lot of times, you know, talking and reading through like briefs and legislation and things that you're not trained for in medical school. So enjoined just means that the that law was not in effect for a period of time. Okay. And Chloe, Dobbs came out June of last year. And maybe just describe in lay people's term what exactly that was and you know why that fueled your interest in this area. So the Dobbs ruling essentially said that there is no constitutional right to abortion. So it overturned Roe and Casey versus Planned Parenthood, which were the two Supreme Court rulings that had provided protection for abortion care. And so it basically allows states to regulate any aspect of abortion care that's not covered by federal law. And I think it's really important to just define abortion, which is just the removal of 
the products of pregnancy from the uterus. And it has nothing to do with the setting. It has nothing to do with why that's happening. It's just a medical term. And it's used in miscarriage care. It's I think that the term abortion has become so politicized that people have forgotten that this is a medical term and a medical procedure that doesn't have anything to do with the reasons why somebody is going in for one. And so I have known people who've had abortions. I just really strongly believe that it is an essential aspect of being able to live a healthy life and that choosing if and when to become a parent is fundamental to your ability to be equal as a human in this society and to control what happens in your own body. And so it's, it's something I felt passionately about. I realized when this ruling happened and there were very quickly a number of states that passed complete abortion bans. And so this is changing all the time. And I think as of right now, there are 15 states that have near or total abortion bans. So those are states where abortion is completely illegal. Some have exceptions for rape or incest. Some do not. Some of those require a police report. Some don't. Some have exceptions for fetal anomalies and some don't. I believe every state now has an exception for life of the mother. Until a few weeks ago, that was not true in Tennessee. And then there are a couple states that have six-week abortion bans, which are essentially basically near total abortion bans. And I realized that if this ruling had happened when I was applying to residency, my list would have looked really different. And two of the top three programs on my list would have not been there. And I realized that if these laws, if state abortion laws impact where people choose to live and work, then there are really significant implications for our workforce that we need to talk about. And people are having a lot of conversations, obviously, around the personal implications of abortion bans and of Dobbs and how that's going to affect people who can get pregnant and patients, providers, but talking about how that's going to impact the urology workforce. I think this has been a much bigger conversation in OBGYN because it more directly, obviously, impacts that field. But we are not immune to it. And I, I wanted to show that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, as I kind of prepared for this podcast, I'm certainly not an expert in abortion and, and policy, but it's incredibly complex. As you've mentioned, you read about the complete abortion bans, the near total, the six weeks. And I think most people would agree that by the time somebody's noticed that their menstruation is a little bit late, you know, lo and behold, you go finally make an appointment with the doctor, you know, that ship has sailed. But one of the terminologies that I came across fairly consistently was the idea of restrictive versus non-restrictive states. Could you maybe just comment a bit on that? Yeah, there is no, I guess, formalized definition. Or a lot of what we took our data from was the Guttmacher Institute. And restrictive states include all of the states that have complete abortion bans or bans uh, that have something like a six-week gestational limit, which in practicality is, is almost a total abortion ban. So I think that's kind of the most restrictive category. There are other states that have laws that require things like a 72-hour waiting period, um, which also imposes a lot of difficulties and hurdles to women actually obtaining an abortion, not covering abortion with federal or Medicare funding. Other restrictions in the laws, you know, requiring people to look at an ultrasound and receive factually incorrect scientific information, things that hinder the ability to obtain an abortion, but still legally will allow a woman to get one if she's able or a person who can get pregnant to leap those hurdles. Those kind of are maybe more in a restrictive category. And then there are protective states where in the state laws, people have the right to an abortion and that's legally protected. Okay, super helpful. So we obviously have a urologist and an ob gyne on the show today. You know, it seems like without being myopic that that would be kind of epicenter type subspecialties that would be affected. But you know, in your perspective, why is this beyond OB, I mean, or beyond urology? Can you maybe just talk a little bit about how a person, a male, a female, a seasoned attending private practitioner, a fellow, a resident, a student, why does this matter? Oh, uh, it, it matters in so many ways. So I'll talk a little bit about one of the the first studies that we did, because I think that answers that question, which was a survey of members of the Society of Women in Urology. 
And this is a subset of the urology population, but an important one. And the group probably most directly impacted by these laws. We did a survey of, of SWU members, and we found that 60% of them said that when they're looking for their next job, there are states that they will avoid specifically because of the jobs ruling. And 41% of practicing urologists said that if this ruling had happened when looking for their current job, they would have picked a different position. 42% of residents and fellows said that if this had happened when they were applying, it would have changed their rank list. And those are huge numbers. And so just looking at that, if we think about the fact that urologists don't provide abortions, but there are urologists who may need abortions. We take care of patients who may need abortions. We take care of the sequela of pregnancy with prolapse incontinence for many patients. And a third of our trainees are women right now. And if for no other reason, reason, if, if more than half of them avoid living in states with abortion bans, then we're going to face really serious workforce shortages in those areas. And we've done some other work looking at the distribution of urologists across the country, and we know that the states that have the most restrictive abortion laws also have the lowest densities of urologists. So they have the fewest urologists per person. They already have workforce shortages. And if people are deciding where to live with their family, and you think about somebody who's coming out of training, maybe they're in their early 30s, maybe they want to get pregnant. And you look at a state where if you had a miscarriage, you would not be certain that you could get appropriate medical care. That's really scary. And it feel, we, we had so many comments from people who said that they don't feel safe living in those states, which I understand. And so whether or not you can get pregnant, there are, are people who have partners or other people they love. There are older urologists who made comments in our survey that they have adult daughters and they were looking to move because they want their daughters to feel comfortable visiting them if they were pregnant. So I think these just have really wide ranging implications. And if we just look at the numbers and look at the data, we need to be concerned because if we ignore this, then 10 years down the line, we're going to find ourselves with no urologists in certain areas of the country. And if that happens, then who's going to treat your septic stone at 2 a.m.? You know, or who's going to do your prostate biopsy? That impacts all other areas of urologic care. And we know that having less access to urologists leads to worse urologic outcomes. And these laws are going to impact where urologists go. Yeah, I think uh, it's one of those things. It seems more actionable as somebody who's still in the decision-making phase of their life. And, you know, by all means, I don't think this is just the medical professional part of one's life, but I would imagine that women seeking out colleges and universities or their first jobs, this is all playing in and, and you're going to start seeing, you know, a change in the absolute number of people and maybe perhaps the type of people that are pursuing living in a certain geography. And if you're applying to college or medical school or residency or fellowship, the balls in your court to some extent, I would say. And it's a little bit easier to shift. But I mean, Bev, maybe your perspective, I think you mentioned that you've been there for about 10 years, you know, either you decide, am I going to, am I going to fight the good fight? Or am I getting out of here? Because this place is not consistent with, you know, how I see things. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm a native North Carolinian, my family still lives here. My husband has a great job here. I think, you know, our kids are established here. I'm committed to the people of North Carolina. So I sort of fall into that category. But I totally understand that this has created such challenges for people doing this work. There's this idea of moral injury where you're in your job, you are hamstrung by the laws that are in place in your state, and you're unable to provide care when it's medically necessary, sometimes without involving a lawyer, sometimes not caring for people until they're at the brink of death. And it is impossible to ask people to do that forever and not feel the strain of that on their life. And so I've talked to people who are very committed to this work, but these restrictions are tiring. I know people that have left states to move to other less restrictive states. I took a few notes of just <laughs> while you were talking, Chloe, because there are like so many other things that can come up. I mean, so most residents are of reproductive age. And luckily, we're in a time where, you know, we're making it possible for residents to start families during residency and making huge progress with not making residents defer their family planning choices until later. And so let's say you move to a restrictive state. What if in that state there are restrictions around what insurance can cover? So your insurance may not cover abortion care, even though you're able to travel to another state to get care if you need it. 
if your insurance doesn't cover it, not only are you paying out of pocket to travel, but you're paying for that care. People make decisions based on their partner's needs as well. And so, you know, if, even if it's a male resident, they have a female partner, they may not want to go to a state that's restrictive for that reason. I think the downstream effects are that, you know, people stay often stay in the state where they train. You know, you make connections when you're a resident. You learn about the jobs there. You sort of envision yourself working in a job that you see or you're around. And so there are those downstream effects. So if people make decisions about not training in a certain area, you know, you're losing out on that talent and those amazing people who could have come to that area and stayed there and made a life there. In a lot of the states that have strict bans, there are also states that have not expanded Medicaid. And so that impacts how patients engage in care and have access to care. And I think it's harder work to live in a state that doesn't have expanded Medicaid because you're caring for more patients who have many more struggles to engage in the medical system. And so it's harder work. It's important work. Don't get me wrong. And I think, you know, we're attracting a lot of residents who are really motivated to to advocate for patients and provide this care. But that's, it's hard work and it's almost a different job in and of itself. There are so many days that I just want to come to work. I just want to do my job. I don't want to have to talk to a reporter. I don't want to have to talk to a lawyer. I just want to take care of people. And unfortunately, that has not been what my life has been like this last year. And it, it gets really tiring. I think one other point to make is that in, in states with very strict bans, I think a lot of people are really concerned about operating on, on patients who are pregnant. What if I have this patient with an emergent urologic need and she's in the first trimester? What if she miscarries from this surgery? Are they going to accuse me of causing an abortion? Am I going to be under a microscope? And I've heard people express that. In my mind, I don't think that should happen at all. But, you know, in some of these restrictive states, I think people feel very much like they're under a microscope. Well, when the risk of being accused of that is a potential felony charge, you know, re- getting your license revoked, having $10,000 fines or things like that, it, that's a really big risk to weigh. Yeah, I think it's worth mentioning that Bev and I don't know each other. I have a dear friend that uh, outside of work, I really respect and admire what they've been able to do in terms of increasing awareness around uh, worsening periterm morbidity for, for mothers. And I reached out to him and I said, hey, you think we could have a chat about workforce issues as a result of Dobbs? And suffice it to say that he said, I would love to do that shared exactly what you're kind of describing, Bev, just the beatdown of taking care of people and all the paperwork and the scrutiny and the politicizing that takes place. But the bottom line is he ultimately said, I cannot do this because I am at a state institution in a extremely restrictive state. And you better believe I'm going to get a call to the ivory tower if I um, go and express my opinions to the point where they've written papers editorial comments, et cetera, and other people have to kind of share that work. So I, I can empathize from conversations with my friend about, about a lot of what you're saying. So Chloe, you talked a little bit about the survey work, particularly among trainees and so forth. Are we actually starting to see this? I don't know if this data exists or not, or the, or the number of applicants to restrictive states, highly restrictive states, changing urology OB across specialties? Is this a theoretical thing or is this a real thing? There was a a recent study that was just published actually looking at all of the NRMP matches. So that actually doesn't include urology. And they saw that there was a greater decrease in applications across all specialties to residency programs in states with restrictive abortion laws compared to states with protective laws. And in OB, that was pretty significant. I think it was about a 10% decrease in applications to those programs. In urology, so we did another survey, we surveyed all of the urology applicants to the match for this cycle. And we had 42% response rate, which is really great. And one out of five took programs off their list specifically because they're located in states where abortion is illegal. And that's a really big number. Um, Our match rate as a specialty the year before was 66%. So this was a group that came into this match knowing that one out of three people didn't match last year and that they're going into a very competitive specialty. And even knowing that 
20% of them took programs off their list. And almost 60% said that if they match in a state with restrictive laws, they would worry about their health and safety or their partner's health and safety. So people have in the last year made decisions about where they want to train based on these laws. We don't have data looking at where people are taking jobs yet, but that's something that we want to look at. But we know, like Bev said, more than half of trainees end up staying in, in the place where they trained in that area. And so if people are choosing to avoid certain states because just to even apply or put on their rank list for residency, that's going to change the demographics of the trainees in those areas. And that's going to have repercussions down the road for the, the people who are practicing medicine there in all specialties. And we, you know, anecdotally, we had people just write comments that they changed their fellowship match list after the ruling happened or people who were going to take a job and they turned it down. Bev, are you seeing this in your most recent interview cycle? Is this something that's coming up from uh, potential match candidates? So Duke is a top 10 residency program and has been for decades. And I think we had roughly the same number of applications. The AAMC data did show that in restrictive states for U.S. seniors, there was a 10% decrease in applications. So like Chloe mentioned, and then with some sort of ban in place, it was probably a 6% decrease. And then there was like a 2% decrease overall, I believe. So it didn't feel quite the same. This year, we also had some changes in our application cycle. We have signaling now. So like that was a little bit different. And so it's hard. It's kind of comparing two different processes. I mean, we still had outstanding applicants to our program. It's hard to know. I mean, it's just it will take a few years to see what's happening. Our residents often about half of them subspecialize and half go into either academic or private practice once they graduate. This year, we had almost all of our residents go into fellowship. So it's a little bit of a different year. And we occasionally have folks that pursue complex family planning for fellowship. I would say that's probably a little bit more over these last few years, but some of that's probably dependent upon faculty mentorship and other things that we've been supporting here. I do think more people are asking questions about it, though. Like, what is like the legislative climate in your state? So the point of interviews, we still had access through 20 weeks. And so we're kind of a purple state, a lot of advocacy opportunities, but having rights chipped away over time. And especially with this new ban that was passed by the legislature last week, I think it's going to have a real impact. And we will have to change, you know, how we get opportunities for residents. So we're looking at other external rotations, other ways that residents can get training. Ideally, they would get that training kind of continuously through their residency program, not just a month here or a month there. I think it's better to get that consistently. Yeah, as I was kind of reading some of what's out there, it does seem that there's been programs that are welcoming to other trainees to come and observe and learn and in person or virtually. But clearly, that's also not totally non-disruptive. I mean, if you have other stuff going on, a family, et cetera, just to pop over to a state that's non-restrictive is not is not trivial. Yeah. No, you have to get a medical license in that state. There are, you know, training agreements. It's, you know, it's not just like, okay, well, you'll go to this clinic this month. There's a lot of preparation and a lot of, a lot that goes on behind the scenes to make that happen. You know, we've gone from abortion being a federally protected right essentially prior to viability with some varying levels of restrictiveness built in through the actual practical implementation of abortion that was Roe. Now we have Dobbs where essentially the decision making is in the hands of the states and we've seen one polar extreme where it's a total ban and then a lot of in between amongst restrictive states that again make it significantly challenging and you know here we are today assessing the impact on the workforce and in medicine and a little bit more in depth on urology and ob you know what's the the kind of transparency obligation for any program as it pertains to this i mean i'm guessing most people are not oblivious to what the policies are but is this something that should be brought up during medical school, residency, fellowship, job recruitment? So we've been doing interviews with urology applicants to talk to them a little bit more about that. And 
a lot have said that they would have really appreciated hearing about this because it's really scary to ask. You're in a vulnerable position when you're applying as a trainee and it's a hot topic. People have really strong feelings in a lot of different ways about it. So a lot of people don't feel like they can ask, but it is going to significantly impact their life. And I think it's really important for both training programs and employers to recognize that however you feel about abortion personally, you may have employees or trainees who need abortion care for whatever reason. And you, ha you just have to understand that, that that might be a part of their life and that they may need help, whether that is help with logistics, taking time off to go out of state to travel to get something if they or their partner needs an abortion, financial help, help just rearranging a schedule, just like they would if they were pregnant or having a baby. These are medical needs and you don't have to personally agree with it, but you have to recognize that people who are working for you may need it. And also, if you are trying to recruit a talented workforce and you're trying to recruit a diverse workforce, especially if you live in a state with restrictive laws, you have to consider that. And whether you want to make policies that specifically address it is you know, up to each individual group. But you might have a hard time recruiting certain people if you live in a state with really restrictive policies. And so having some kind of signal to people that you would help them or support them in that situation would be helpful. So, you know, especially if in places of urologists, there are clinical implications, too. You know, we, we don't provide abortion care, but we do prenatal counseling for GU abnormalities. We do vasectomies. We do infertility care. All of those things do have really direct impacts from the Dobbs ruling. We're already seeing impacts with rising vasectomy rates and things like that. So people are paying attention to it. And it's a little bit naive to think that you can just turn a blind eye to this entire topic if you live in a restrictive state and think it won't impact you at all. The Ryan Residency Program, which is out of UCSF, created a guide for at least OBGYN residents in thinking about applying to kind of restrictive or purple states and how to ask those questions delicately, how to get the information. And it was meant to be like a resource guide for OB residents. And I think it probably would be useful for other residents kind of making those decisions. One of the best resources for understanding what's going on in individual states is the Guttmacher Institute has up-to-date data about access and laws, and you can get like a fact sheet for each state. And so that can be helpful. But I do think the culture of a program impacts your life as a resident in so many ways. Like, will your residency program be supportive of you with whatever health challenge you encounter as a resident or whatever need you might have that is unanticipated. And so there, I think there are ways to ask those questions as well and still get the information that you need. Yeah, I think, you know, for urology, it's been really interesting, even over the course of my involvement in urology, to see the increase diversity within urology, increased representation, certainly I think when I was considering it as a field, it was still a predominantly male-dominant, white male-dominant field. And, you know, the energy, the emphasis on things that are pertinent and relevant in the 21st century is, is really wonderful to see. And I get the sense that it doesn't really kind of matter where you are for a urology residency. It's typically a forward-thinking, progressive group of people. And I say all this because... I think one of the things that got a lot of press in our world was the statement that the American Urology Association put out on behalf of its membership, and then and then a bit of, about the backlash. Chloe, are you familiar with that whole kind of process? Yeah. The AUE essentially put out a statement, I don't have the text in front of me, but that basically said that they defer to their colleagues in the House of Medicine on the abortion issue, and that they don't condone any ruling that might interfere with the provider-patient relationship. And there there were some very strong reactions, and I know that a lot of people wrote to the board, and we heard from some of the board members at the AUA meeting, actually, about the response. There were a lot of people in our survey who felt really unsupported, felt that the statement from a professional medical organization just made them feel like they don't have a place in this specialty. And there were a lot of comments that Abortion is evidence-based medicine, and it's our job, and it's the job of professional medical societies to support evidence-based medicine, and that includes abortion care. 
And, you know, again, I, I really recognize that this is a complex topic and that people have some really, really strong feelings about this. And I think that there is a general sense that a society needs to recognize the needs of its members and its patients and follow medical guidelines. And there is a lot of disappointment that there wasn't a stronger statement just that abortion is healthcare and that that needs to be something that's protected. Yeah. And I mean, you know, I was also one of those people that was just like, that seems a little, I think lukewarm is is a, a pretty good term for it. And then they, you know, to their credit, in my opinion, they followed up with the, you know, try to dig in a little bit deeper on who's the demographic that feels this is relevant to our field. And to, to maybe paraphrase, suffice to say that younger people and women felt that this is a priority, whereas more senior people that have been in practice for a long time, predominantly white male, felt like things were adequate with the statement. Is that, uh, is that roughly fair? Yeah, it's, it, you really, it's, it's a great example of the need to look closely at data because their overall statement was that I think 57% or over half of respondents, the AAUM members said no to the question, should we spend time and resources on advocacy related to some of these issues like abortion care? But then when you actually break it down by age, there's a huge, very stark difference between generations. And two thirds of trainees said yes, compared to 80 something percent of retired urologists who said no. And so when you actually look at the data, younger urologists and people who are coming into this field really clearly want advocacy on abortion and the vast majority of those, over 90 percent, want the AUA to oppose any policies that restrict access to abortion care. This newer generation is a group that really cares about this topic. They want advocacy. We already can see that it is impacting where they're choosing to live and work. And 30 percent of urologists are 65 or older. And so we're going to have a we have a lot of people retiring soon. We have a big workforce shortage that's already happening and, and just going to get worse. And younger urologists are going to move up and kind of replace some of these people who are, are growing older. So I think that the attitudes of the field are shifting. And it's important. I know that the AUA has been trying to, to sort of please all of its members and then therefore not really pleased anybody. And it's a tough spot to be in. But I think they should also recognize where the field is going and, and what things are going to look like in five years, because I think it's it's different. I think it is powerful when other medical organizations make statements. I mean, OBGYNs are involved in advocacy until we're blue in the face. And, you know, it does help to have other medical professionals who understand the medical system, understand what is evidence-based medicine, who can stand up and say, hey, this is important. This impacts people in other ways. We've had folks with the Cancer Center that have worked with us on op-eds. We've had folks from the law school, folks from across the medical center that have been involved in talking about these issues. And it's very powerful when medicine can be a united force to say, you know what, maybe we need to stand up for this. Maybe we need to speak out in a more vocal way. And also our OBGYN colleagues, we're getting tired. <laughs> we need some help. So for all the urologists that are listening, that are thinking about getting involved in advocacy, this is an important issue. And so reach out, find ways you can support your colleagues at your institutions. You know, you mentioned something earlier, Bev, that, that certainly struck a chord with me, you know, especially with Mother's Day, you know, in two days. I uh, I'll share a little bit of a personal story. So we have two boys and um, about five years ago, roughly around this time, we were pregnant. Not we, my wife was pregnant. And we were living in Texas. And, you know, things were kind of cruise control, supposed to have a little baby girl. And, you know, we go to the OB and it became very obvious that things were not going well. Fortunately, being in the medical field, we were able to get a lot of information quick. We got a fetal MRI and met with the pediatrics team, the OB team. And suffice it to say that, um, you know, things were not going to be sustainable. So we, uh, you know, I called my chairman, his amazing person. I was like, Hey, we've got a split. And at that time, you know, we're into late, well, into about 30 weeks. So there were very limited options. And that was, I think, you know, that post viability is clearly a, a super duper hot button area. But at, at that time, you know, we we're kind of freaking out, doing research. And one of the important things and amazing things was that, you know, there's a whole team of OBs. It was intense for everybody involved. 
they were like, you know, this is not going to end well. You know, here's some resources in Colorado and Santa Fe and California. And we made the um, extremely difficult decision to fly to California and get an abortion. And the whole thing was just, it was brutal. It was just intense. And despite the fact that we knew that this baby was not going to survive, you know, despite all that, it was crazy. And fortunately, we had the means to do that. It was crazy expensive. Nothing was covered. Flying to some like random spot and like putting yourself up and like, and thankfully my sister's in LA, but despite that, it was awful. You want to, especially in the context of something terrible like that, you want to be like kind of in a familiar setting. And I guess it just takes a lot of this hypothetical stuff. And that was, okay, one end of the spectrum. You know, I kind of acknowledge that, but this might be like the day to day, you know, that you know, whether it's medical or, you know, there's, there's maternal health, there's all the super unpleasant things, rape and incest, but you know, for people to just have to drop their life and head out elsewhere is, it's crazy. And, you know, we went to a support group after about 18 months, it was called ending a wanted pregnancy. And that was also just a, you know, a totally mind blowing experience to sit around with people that have gone through something that you really can't appreciate until you've done it. And I, I'll never forget, there was somebody there that shared her story and was telling about her very conservative family and how her grandmother was like, well, it's okay that you did it because you had to. And the person in the group was like, you can't take that stand, you know? It's either you're okay with it or, or you're not, but it can't be like an exception for me. And, you know, I hats off to my wife. She's been super proactive in terms of advocacy and um, sharing her story with the with the Texas legislature while we were there. It took a while, you know, this, we weren't kind of ready for this like a week afterwards, but sometimes I think it's easy enough to be like, this is something like abstract and like people don't go through it or people like me don't go through it, but it's not is, is kind of my thing. And I remember, you know, flying out there, it was like Mother's Day and she looked pretty pregnant and, and uh, it was just kind of a, a wild thing that takes, takes this and, and has a hit very close to home. Well, thank you for sharing that story. I mean, it's a very powerful story. It's a it's a heartbreaking story. And I think it highlights that people make thoughtful decisions about their life and parents do not want their children to suffer. And that is an act of motherhood right there, not wanting your child to suffer. And I think people forget that. They get caught up in the ideology of in the politics of this, but there are real people living real lives where things happen that we can't anticipate. And you can't create a list of exceptions because there's always an exception to the rule or an exception to the exception. And I, you know, I feel for, for you and your family having to go through that, that's something that you'll probably carry around with you forever. Well, it, it certainly inspired us and our family to do what we can, you know, with advocacy. And, um, you know, maybe as we conclude here, some thoughts, parting thoughts, and kind of where we are. And maybe importantly, you know, what can we do? Sometimes I think these large political scale things are, they're a little overwhelming, but um, what can we do, you know, as, as a person, as a field to help get back what I would consider fundamental health care? I mean, I think getting involved with your local medical societies, because they do often make statements. And I think as more progressive physicians are in a part of the field, like Chloe was mentioning, things will change. I mean, this younger generation is more progressive than ever. That gives me hope. And I think Chloe's generation, y'all are going to make some important things happen. I feel really bad that there's so much put on on your generation that we've that we've got to work on. But but y'all are already doing amazing things. So you know, getting involved with these organizations that have typically not been very diverse, that have been more senior folks in the field, you know, injecting that change into your local medical society is important. Voting, understanding who your legislators are, reach out to your legislators, to your institution and start having conversations with them because there are so many things in medicine that we can advocate for, whether it's Medicaid expansion or, 
other issues that you see on a daily basis that are impacting your patients. And then when an issue like access to abortion comes up, you have those relationships and contacts and you can keep those lines of communication open. Op-eds, letters to the editor, those are really helpful about issues around abortion, especially when it's coming from people who are not OBGYNs who see the impacts in their own field. Yeah, I think um, there are a lot of different ways to get involved and people often underestimate the power of local involvement, whether that's with your city council, you know, state representatives, they're often a lot more accessible than national uh, level politics. And really just talking about it, I think so much of this, you know, when people have really strong opinions about abortion, and then they they hear a story like yours, Aditya, which is so powerful and so difficult. It opens people's minds, I think, a little bit more when you start, every time you realize more and more of the nuance that goes into it, when you realize that there are people who are having an active miscarriage and can't fly out of state to get an abortion just medically. I think we need to talk about that. It's still something that is surrounded with a lot of stigma and a lot of shame. And when one out of four women have had an abortion at some point in their life, we're surrounded by people who have gone through this. And every single one of those stories is unique and complex. And understanding what goes into that and understanding that these are just decisions that have to be made by the person and their doctor, I think really that understanding only happens when you you talk about it more. And then we talked about things like policies to help trainees or employees feel protected if they need to travel out of state. Being open about the support that people would have, I think it's really key. Well, I, I certainly appreciate that. And, you know, thanks for sharing your expertise, helping to raise awareness on how this impacts all of us uh, is the way I kind of see it. And um, just like most things in life, everything's fine until it's not fine, or whether that's for you or a loved one or a colleague, statistically, there is somebody that you know and love that it was not fine for, or it may not be fine for in the future. And we've got to raise awareness and I remain optimistic and, you know, with the energy of the upcoming generation, you know, with our progressive past in this field that we can kind of get back to something that's safe and acceptable. Well, thanks, Chloe. Thanks, Bev, so much for your time. And, you know, I learned a tremendous amount today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aditya. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to follow the podcast, rate it five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at underscore Backtable OBGYN on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable OBGYN is hosted by myself, Mark Hoffman, and Amy Park. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon, with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, and Ness Smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz, with support from Taylor Spurgeon Hess and Yvonne Ovrijinsky. Show notes and social media by Jody Lenora. Administrative support provided by Jim Lee Kennebrew. Music written and performed by Scott Baby Daddy Hoffman. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you again next time. The views and opinions expressed by the hosts and guests on Backtable OBGYN are their own and do not reflect the views or positions of their employers or any entities they represent.